Greetings, everybody. This is Archangel McIntosh, a.k.a. Mika El Israel, from the 12 tribes of Israel, um, from the tribe of Levi, and the tribe of Judah. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day, and um, hope you've seen my previous videos before this, um, part two, this part three. Um, today, we're going to talk about common law, and we're also going to talk about the man-made law. Um, in the next video, which will be the last video, we're also talking about sovereignty. And these will be the only free videos that I share with you guys about um, about the school thing. Everything else will be demos and um, I'll be selling them for a decent price, affordable price and at a good rate. So absorb as much as you can right now for y'all that want to grab up free information, not give anything back. And, you know, kind of want to learn things but then don't want to pitch in, you know. Absorb as much as you can. Make sure you have your pen, pencil, and pad and take your notes because if this may be the last you hear from me because you're not part of the, the tribe, you're not part of the school or community, may this be what frees you at least. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to start off with common law. Um, once again, check out the previous videos if you haven't seen it. And, um, and let's continue. Common law. Common laws are divine principles that are commonly known and accepted by man in society, a group of people with mutual, aka common beliefs. Common means something that everybody in a certain location or group usually knows or is aware of or a topic that is popular and famous. Law means fictional rules principles and regulations made, created, and accepted by and for a group of people or corporations agreeing to adapt to such philosophy, way of life, what they think is common. It is also known as popular law because it is based on what people popularly or commonly believe is true, solid law, and the way to live, act, think, and breathe. Common law, also known as common sense, can be used as God's law or as man's law. Yahweh's law, Yahawashi's law, Yahawashai's law, the Most High's law. Depending on who people popularly give the power, focus, time, energy, and jurisdiction to. May the Most High be common to men. Overall, universal law and natural law, such as we all eat, breathe, use the bathroom, think, feel, create, attract, bleed, and etc., are common laws of life. We have the right to speak, create, remain silent, defend ourselves, bear arms, forge for food, contract, and or not contract with who we want to contract and or not contract with, to travel, assemble, protest, complaint, change, evolve, grow, believe, watch, see, witness, and etc. because that is common to man. Men popularly know that, approve of this, and accept that in his and in or her own heart and community. If we commonly believed the contrary, then the contrary would become what is common in the community and in our heart. Man's law will never be and can never be fully common law to the universe and over the universe. Man's law is only common to and for man and only applied to men who deliberately, awaringly, and intentionally agree to enter such acceptance, aka contract. If you are consciously consenting to an agreement or a way of life, then that is common to you subconsciously. Because what's common ain't common to everybody. Other beings from and in different planets live by a completely different set of common law, rules, or commonly accepted principles. We can commonly accept oppression or we can commonly eliminate oppression completely. We can, com we can commonly do things together, but that doesn't mean that your laws apply to me. And when it do, I will know that it applied to me. And you will know when it applied to you. 
Popularity, consent, and acceptance are commonly valued authorities. What will we allow to be commonly acceptable law among us and in and for our community? Violence or peace? Because it will be enforced by the system, community, society, tribe, people, schools, places, and authority and cause a domino effect. They will use their radical followers, idol worshippers, voters, registrants, and those who lack awareness and knowledge of the common acceptance, common law, and lack awareness and knowledge of self. In other words, ignorant people or pawns in this game sent to scare people, suppress the truth, eliminate knowers of the truth, and distract potential knowers of the truth. They're attempting to bury the common laws of Yah um, Yahweh, God, divinity, life, all law, and oblivion. They're pretty much trying to eliminate our self-control, uh, control over ourself. Common law beliefs of and faith in love, peace, and unity in today's world has been turned into military, Admiralty, martial, Martian, and governmental commonly allowed and not fought against hate law list and or laws of hatred. If we do not fight for our freedom or if we deny that we are slaves and lack freedom right now, then we are supporting our slavery, ignorance, and blindness. Ignoring a fact does not make it disappear, nor does it make it not true. This is commonly understood. This is the trick and deception that, they've been, that they use in today's court system. Nowadays, fear, cowardice, malice, malice intent, malevolence, and hate are commonly and popularly accepted by the people of America and the system called the United States Incorporated. International Incorporation. Humanity has been deceived by the so-called leaders and their commonly accepted crew ways of living. They impose their man-made artificial laws on us because we accept it through our passive silence, like a person being raped but does not fight it off. It's not rape if you accept it, allow it, and don't fight it off. It's called consensual intercourse. They are using your consent and passiveness to mind intercourse you, in other words, inter to intercept your mind. For example, we are being mind self-raped willingly. So we're raping ourselves. We're mind raping our own self by allowing them to manipulate our mind, to forcefully intercourse our mind and interfere with our mind. You see? Interfering with your thoughts. Their thoughts now your thoughts. You don't have your thoughts. They have their own thoughts. So you've probably been following them and idolizing them. That's why you shouldn't idolize and look up to and things like that. You should respect and honor. Preserve the common laws of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. The laws need to be taken seriously now. And we need to make sure that our cruel we need to make sure that cruelty never becomes common. Only love is common and only love is known to give life. Hey, fear and passiveness steals lives and steals souls. Get back to the common laws of the Most High and be the pilot of your flesh. Um... All right, so the next one that we're going to go ahead and read will be man-made law. We'll go ahead and continue with that. So I hope you guys are enjoying this. I've put a lot of work into this and it's, you know, been taking me time to complete and just so much is being exposed, man. I'm putting my life on the line right now, you know. So here we go. Man-made laws are exclusively based on contract, agreement, and consent. Now we're entering into the world of the man now, you see. This is helping us see how everything connects and the order it's supposed to go in. What are man-made artificial laws and what use and purpose do they serve me and you? 
The law of men or the man-made laws of the land are divine principles, the Most High's commandments, and an exact mimic version of the covenant and agreement that man has with the Most High. These laws that govern the land is founded on the basic principles of natural law, organic law, universal law, inherent law, divine law, contract law, the law of the sea, the laws of the sky, the laws of the elements, the law of survival, the law of choice and free will, the law of truth, trust, wisdom, cause, effect, reward, punishment, and maxims of law. This includes but is not limited to morals, fair play, equality, unity, community, remedy, redress, consequence, rewards, truth, honor, responsibility, knowing right from wrong, the power to contract, agree, bond, mortgage, loan, credit, and or debit or not. The right to deny and admit, to speak, to travel, walk, talk, breathe, eat, shit, and other natural self-evident tr self truths that are unalienable. We are the creditors of man's law because we are the ones that give it value and define how far we will let it run. We are in charge of what happens to the land and earth. That is a condition and part of our whole covenant with the most honorable. We have a right to not let malicious intending people control us, our life, property, freedom, and choices. The system we see today is in great conflict with these natural and universal divine principles and laws. Therefore, we are being punished for breaching our primal contract with the Most High, universal laws, common law, inherent law, organic law, and so on. We sell each other every day for dollars, private corporate promissory notes, to secure our position in this twisted, satanic, ritualized game and get lost in labels, names, judgments, titles, words, lab um, symbols, idols, letters, definitions, numbers, signs, and all. In other words, in basic language, we are being manipulated and controlled by the human's left brain survival-based logical thinking, self-flattering and self-centralized ego, the edging God out of your life syndrome. Look around you and see and feel that this is self-evident and it has gone too far. No worries, just pure peace of mind in a mountain-sized bank of serenity. Man's law is also known as laws made by humans, also known as artificial laws, also known as understanding the most highs laws are completely based on contract, consent, agreement, and consideration. There are three vital and essential elements that make an, an agreement or contract a perfect, uh, a, per, a perfected valid, pardon me. There are three vital and essential elements that make an agreement a perfected valid contract, a perfected valid claim, and it must be based on good faith, truth, full disclosure, and honesty. Therefore, if they're not using honesty, full disclosure, good faith, and truth in your contract, you can, um, you can terminate it. It becomes null and void. They broke their contract. The first contract, first of all, to protect and serve you or to protect the natural laws. Someone break the, their contract with you, they're breaking their contract with the Most High too. Because we are the Most High manifested, manifested in flesh. That's who Christ is, the Christed one, which is us, at least the 12 tribes of Israel. So I don't know about any other strangers and Gentiles, but my people, this is how we, we, we know things are in harmony. As above, so below. So if there's a judge on earth, there's a judge in heaven. If there's a jail on earth, there's a jail in heaven. If we do contracts on earth, there are contracts in heaven. You see, it just works like that. We don't care who agrees or not. Not everyone is. Two-thirds must die. One, both and or, all parties must make an offer. For a matter to be resolved, it must first be expressed, disclosed, and understood by the receiving and sending parties. Two, 
both and or all parties must give mutually agreeable and adequate consideration. For example, what will you give me for this offer? What is in it for me? What do you want for this or that, etc., etc.? Three, both and or all parties must consent, agree, assent, affirm, and accept the offer in consideration. So the three parts to that contract would be offer, consideration, and acceptance. It must be dated, signed, and notarized and or witnessed by a minimum of three competent witnesses with the legal age or over, the, or, or over to confirm and validate your identity, signature, and content. This is how a contract becomes authorized. Pardon me. This is how a contract becomes authorized, officialized, legalized, enforceable, binding, bonding, activated, and admissible as evidence in a court of law, <clears throat> in a court of man law. This form of perfected contracting is called a bilateral contract <clears throat> or an explicit agreement or explicit consent. It is running both ways and both parties are fully aware and conscious of the contents in terms of the contract or agreement that they are willing fully entering. Whether they know how to enforce it or not or what was said in the contract or not or know what was said in the contract or not. Once it is accepted and agreed upon willingly, it is a set and done deal. The bilateral offer, bilateral consideration, bilateral consent, and what is being promised to be performed or completed is sufficient enough to instantly lock you and or them and officially, to lock them and officially Wait, pardon me. To instantly lock you in or them and officially and officially in a private binding contract and jurisdiction that is between you and that person, unless consented to otherwise. So right here I put in instead of in, so I got to change that up. So that is enough to instantly lock you in or them and the officially that can lock you in or in or them. Okay, pardon me. I get it. So it is enough to instantly lock you in, in, in or them, and officially, in a private binding contract and jurisdiction that is between you and that person, unless consented to otherwise. So I got to work on this a little bit, but you get it. This can be used against you in or them in any court. The other form of contract is the weaker version of a legit contract. But, is, but it is the most often used in today's society, court and governing system. And this form of contracting is called a unilateral contract. A unilateral contract is a contract that is ran one way. Here are the elements of a unilateral contract. One, one person, side, firm, or corporation makes an offer to you. They make their consideration. Three, you consent to it, but never counteracted it with your own offer, terms, conditions, or consideration. And they have not consented on paper with their signature to your conditions and terms. Therefore, this contract is considered a unilateral contract, tacit agreement, one-way contracting. That means that you are unconsciously and unawaringly that mean that mean that you unconsciously and unawaringly entered a voidable contract that can be used against you if you do not explicitly rebut it, deny it, or state the facts on and for the record. Tacit agreements in unilateral contracts are considered default judgments, default contracts. Silence is a tacit authorization. For example, if I ask you, do you mind if I take your car for a joyride and potentially crash it and not pay for it? And you say nothing. And I ask you it two more times. Do you mind? Do you mind? Do you mind? Before I actually do it? 
you are passively, tacitly, assenting, agreeing to my terms, conditions, offer, consideration, and all contained therein. That means I can take your car and joyride and crash it and not pay for it and I can use that against you in court because you agreed to me doing it. Like I told you, if y'all don't mind the government putting their fucking boot on your head and you, don't, and you don't mind sitting there getting beat up and don't fight back and you get bullied for the rest of your life, that can go down. That can legitimately go down. You can even sell your soul to the devil on contract. The devil can legitimately walk his ugly ass self into court and sue your ass based on that contract. Contract rules the land. It doesn't matter who's doing it, who made it, or whatever. It's all about who agreed to it because you have the right to you're a sovereign. You have the power to give away your sovereignty. And many have without knowing no. We have to get that back. That's the whole purpose of this school. Spiritually sovereign and indigenous creditors of mother of me. The system uses default judgments to seize homes, repo cars, and charge you a bill every month because you have not been indo indoctrinated on what a contract is, how it's used, what is its purpose, and how to properly conduct one. You are not told that this contract can be turned into money, dollars, value, ledger, and sold in a stock market for 10 times the price that you promised originally and that you are the master of where it go where it's when it's sent how it's used and so on you have complete control over all this money and stuff man over the bills over everything or over your whole life they know these things this is the one loophole is the truth the truth is the, the truth is the loophole that's all is the that's what the loophole is. The loop ain't the loophole ain't a lie. It's actually the truth. So all they have to do is keep the truth there and keep you away from it. That automatically keeps you away from the loophole. There's only one way in, one way out, and it's from this Christ consciousness. From realizing you are the Christed one. You are the one who has been crucified. Yourself has been dead. You have to resurrect again and shine that light inside the dark. We are not trained to properly manifest a solid contract into reality based on undeniable truth, the opposite of perjury. Therefore, they use this as evidence against you and use their bogus, one-sided, null and void contracts to take your shit. Unilateral contracts are instruments that are still in contemplation as if a full bilaterally aware agreement and contract has not been agreed upon or taken seriously yet. Repeat that. Unilateral contracts are instruments, documents that are still in contemplation. I'm still thinking about it. Although I signed your paper. As if a full, a full bilaterally aware, where both people are aware, agreement and contract has not been as established or agreed upon nor taken seriously. It's not a perfected contract. Contract and consent is the ruler of man's laws besides the fact that a contract cannot be in conflict with the Most High's laws, morals, and natural principles. We are all equal and endowed with magnificent co-creator and co-destroyer powers. This is our inheritance. Let us proceed. Our ancestors believed that it was and is still self-evident that the God, slash the creator of nature, is the sovereign of the universe and everything in it, as well as mankind. It is endowed, it, pardon me, it endowed all mankind with certain unalienable rights, making them self-directing sovereigns, which means that any governments instituted among men derive their just powers only from the consent of the governed, who are the source of earthly power and authority. So when you get an attorney or a public defender or a lawyer, who is hiring them? You. Therefore, you are the authority. All, even though they are representing you, you can be like, hey, today you're not going to represent me. I hired you. I can terminate this contract with you. I can fire you. So if we are the one who gave the government the power to govern us because we need help with our shit, they're working for us. They're pretty much our maid. They're doing the dirty work that we don't want to do. 
But too bad this dirty work involves the whole system and it involves, and it involves the army and involves guns and power. So now they can just easily just be like, fuck that. We don't need to work for him no more. We own their army. We have their army. We can just use their army and shit and not go through them. So now they're using our army, our policemen, our system against us because we haven't stepped up and be like, y'all, hey, power of attorney, you're fucking fired. Lawyer, you're fucking fired. Judge, you're fucking fired. Trustee, you're fucking fired. You're misappropriating my funds, abusing your power, passing a boundary. You know, things like that. You got to know your authority. And plus, you don't have a contract with this person acting like they're, they're your representative or authorized agent or your attorney. They don't have a contract. If they do, they need to put it on it for the record, validate it so the jury and the people can see it and make a proper judgment. Or everyone's going to be breaking common law and will be abominated. Just point blank, even if they hurt you. They will be abominated. Just trust this. Trust the Most High. Hence, any attempt to exercise any... Hold on. So the, the government derived their just powers only from the consent of the governed, who are the source of earthly power and authority. Hence, any attempt to exercise any powers not conveyed by the people is unjust and unauthorized, and any act done pursuant to such usurpation of power is null and void, ab initio. They were further convinced that God's temporal law for mankind was expressed in the law of the land, Mosaïs. Common law is common sense law. It is simple, straightforward, and self-evident, primarily because it is based on the Most High's laws, God's law, whatever you want to call it. That is the foundational law of the Union of States. The Founding Fathers authorized three legal systems in the Constitution. First, common law. Second, secondly, equity law, which is money law. And the third, admiralty law, which is the law of the sea, the law of the artificial sea or ocean. Gradually, common law has been d displaced by equity law, which is money law. Things that has to do with business and money instead of common, not financial and not based on money stuff. And, ad and it's, it's a mix of admiralty, which means it's money and it's based on the sea. So they're, they're on the sea trying to charge you something and you're not even on the sea with them. You're on the land and you didn't even break a, a, a financial law. You broke a common law or something. It's, it's twisted, but you'll, you'll be able to put it in this right perspective as you learn. So gradually, common law has been displaced by equity law. Until today, the common law is rarely heard of or understood because, as it, because it has been covered up and hidden away by the legal fictitious profession for very understandable business reasons, corporate reasons, commercial reasons, trying to make money reasons. Shit, they got to feed their family too in this game they created, right? And y'all keep funding the system and don't want to break away from it, right? So they have to do certain things to keep making money. So you guys are doing this to yourself. Such people are pursuing their own private agenda. In fact, the common law is generally looked upon as obscene. Don't talk about common law in my court. They're warring with God, warring with the Most High, warring with Yahweh Shai, Yahweh Shai, Yahweh, Yahweh. They're warring with the ultimate creator of everything. They're trying to act like man created man. Man couldn't create man unless God gave man the power to give birth to man. You see, the creator gave us power to give birth to man. It can take it away. Don't tempt the creator, guys. Don't vex it. Just don't. If my drawings start cursing me out and my creations start going all crazy corrupt, I'm going to fucking destroy it because it cannot come destroy me. I cannot have my creation going against me. It must be destroyed. I don't give a fuck what my creation. So, oh, he's Satan or, or he's God. I don't give a fuck. You're my creation. You're not obeying me. You need to be erased. I gave you life, I must take it back. The creator think these ways, guys. I'm not the creator. I'm under these same laws too. I'm man. My flesh man. My spirit's the most high. My flesh man. And I'm under man's law with my flesh. I have to respect both of them. Or my spirit will be free and my, my flesh get shot up. You know what I'm saying? Or if I save my flesh and not save my spirit, I committed a bigger sin. So there's no way. There's no way to get everyone on your side. So, such people are pursuing their own private agenda. 
In fact, the common law is generally looked upon as obscene. For example, to have a common law marriage is considered to be unclean. Why? The first marriage license in the United States was issued in 1863, which means from year zero there was no license, there was no marriage licenses. All of a sudden, after 1,863 1, years, people start getting marriage licenses. This is the only way to live now. People don't even know the history behind when the Social Security came in, the data came in, why it came in, birth certificates don't know why it came in, when it came in, marriage licenses, people don't know why it came in, when it came in. These things wasn't here since day zero. Because your natural covenant and contract and permission comes from the Most High. It gave you permission to be with who you want. It gave you permission to enjoy its fruits and be fruitful. It gave you permission to travel and do what you want. Man don't want you to enjoy that. That's Satan. Saturn. The question is not whether some third party should or should not perform the service. It is whether sovereigns must get permission from their servants, the government, before they can get married. So once again, the question is not whether some third party should or should not perform the service. It is whether sovereigns must get permission from their servants, the government, before they can be married naturally. So all marriages that has to do with the government is a corporate marriage. It's a corporate um, um, symbol and corporate thing. It's a corporate status. Once you get married, you become, um, two, you become partners in the business, like a partnership, co-partners. So if one person, you both have to f pitch into the corporation because now y'all members. So the child is the corporation. Y'all both have to put money into the child, the corporation. Now once one of y'all leave the child or leave the corporation or the other, other partner, the one leaving or staying can take half. You see, because it's a corporate contract. They can take half of the corporation plus the corporational product, which is the child. So the marriage and all that and the birth certificate is all forms of trapping you in man-made private corporate um, contracts and codes. It's shit you don't need to do, but now you need to because you got into the contract and need to revoke it in order to not fulfill it or need to fulfill it. So what are private laws? Private laws are rules which comes into being when people enter into agreements creating the rules and terms by which they agree to be bound together. State and federal constitutions are examples of private law. They come under the heading of contract law because they are contracts that establish governments, governments, governing minds, governmentals, and are designed to protect the people from the government. To keep the government under control, the people were very precise in the language that they used to make it perfectly <clears throat> to make it perfectly clear exactly what powers were being delegated. In other words, what powers were being given or gave. And that any powers not specifically delegated were reserved by the people or secured by the people to the states or the people. And the people in the states anyway. Through the states, the people run who becomes president and stuff. Or whoever they want to be their leader. But that leader is not everyone's leader. They're the leaders of the voters and the citizens that apply to have a leader. Not everyone. It, things got too far. I didn't vote for anybody and I'm constantly being put under voters' laws. Like, why the hell? Make no sense. It should be remembered that the people are the sovereigns of state government and the states are the govern uh, are and the states are the sovereigns of the federal government. Thus the people either directly or indirectly are the sovereigns over both governments, federal and state. The states have been given specific and limited power. They also made sure that the people also made sure there were provisions that safeguarded the people's rights to abolish or change that government or the system and to create a different one if they choose. Have we chose that yet? Or have we chose to keep the same old bullshit? Public law is a form of private law that results when laws are made in proper application of the delegated authority conveyed to the legislators. And the legislators, a man or woman that makes up laws out of thin air, you can't walk around with teeth anymore. You can't breathe air no more. And whoever signs into those contracts, that law applies to them, they can't breathe or they'll really be sued. 
<laughs> so legislators, a man or woman, a man or woman that makes a law of thin air, think he's God. <laughs> Title 18. The federal, the federal criminal code is an example of public law. It was drafted to grant unto non-citizens the protections and defenses citizens have under common law. Title 18 does not apply to sovereign citizens, which means if you're a citizen of a sovereign, if you are a member of another sovereign, sovereigns aren't citizens, who answer directly to violations of God's laws. Administrative law is one term used to describe private law that comes into existence when someone acquires dominion over others and can dictate to them what the law is. Title 26, the Internal Revenue Code, IRS Code. In an example of, of administrative law, it and the other federal titles classified by Congress as non-public administrative laws Thus, apply only to subjects of the federal government. So, once again, Title 26, the Internal Revenue Code, in an example of administrative law, it and the other federal titles classified by Congress as non public administrative laws. Thus, apply only to subjects of the federal government or debtors of the crediting government. Although we are the creditors of the government, they are our subject in principle. I also talk about administrative law and um, some of the other um, sections that I have here. There's a lot of things I've, I'm, I'm actually sharing on here, so, you know, so there's a lot to be learned pretty much, especially for newbies. In 1938, the United States abandoned public law and adopted an unconstitutional system called public policy or public policing. An understanding of this distinction is so vital that the definitions of these terms follow. Public law, that portion of law which deals with the powers, rights, duties, capacity, and incapacity of incapacities of government and its delegated authority, its given authority, its orders. Those laws which are concerned with the government and its political capacity considered in its quasi private personality in other words as capable of holding or exercising rights or acquiring and dealing with property in the character of an individual or a, a artificial person public policy this is a law of public policy public law would would wait hold on let me see where we are public law public policy I, public law would be natural public law, the law of the public and, you know, the natural laws where people have the power. Public policy now mean a, a corporation's policy and their public is their citizens. The, the, the club's public, you know, like when you have a group of people in your club, that is your private public. So it's confusing because when we hear the word public, we're thinking of the general public when it's really the private public. So the private public the private membership is has private policy policing so they can police over the um, officers and the members to make sure they're fulfilling their contract with that public club or private public club they're changing the context of the words guys the rules and procedures policy rules and procedures of a sovereign over its subjects or creditor over its debtor it holds that no subject can lawfully do that which has a tendency to be injurious to the public or against the public good as defined by the sovereign. Public policy is set by the legislative acts, actions, and persuaded thereto by judicial and administrative pro pro promulgating of rules and regulations. Such rules and regulations, they're trying to regulate your life and regulate your spirit, make you regular and rule you are therefore not laws but rather terms imposed by contract agreements it's the contracts themselves which make these rules and regulations binding if you're not a party to those contracts not a not a subject or property of the government you can make yourself a party by volunteering to comply so why they saying why aren't you complying or did you resist 
If you say you didn't re resist, that means you didn't resist, you complied. So, hell yeah, I resist. Why wouldn't I re resist? Why the fuck this human in this suit putting his hand on me? I have no contract with him or her. He has no right to breach my boundaries in my body. He had broke common law. But unfortunately, there's no more common law courts to argue things this way. They'll just tell you that this ain't the right court because every court now is public policy court, which means private corporate courts based on administrative and administration, which means based on debtor and creditor relationships and who owes who and stuff like that, not who messed up what or damaged what or injured who. It's more about who owes who. Like, why do I owe someone if I have no contract? So, okay. But once you decide to play the game, you are compelled by the rules of that game to continue to play. Once compelled, the best out is to assert your sovereign rights and to evoke, revoke those contracts and agreements. The very concept of public policy and this inherent usurpation of power, of power from the sovereign people are so addictive and has become so widely accepted by bureaucrat, um, bureaucrats and all levels of government that they act as if they were the masters of the people. This shift in government was instituted with the, with the Supreme Court's decision in the Every Railroad case, as a result of which all Supreme Court decisions prior to that time are being treated as no longer relevant in equity court proceedings. And so another milestone was reached in the conspiracy to overthrow the rights of the people. And no one ever done shit about it. Like 9-11, no one ever did shit about it. The Boston Bombers, no one ever did shit about it. The Columbine School shooting, no one ever did shit about it. Them attacking innocent people in Iraq for no reason, no one ever did shit about it. We know they're going to start using nuclear bombs and weapons on us and we still don't want to do shit about it. Well, let it rip. Why wouldn't? You know, if you keep saying, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, and someone give it to you, you can be like, why did you give it to me? You keep asking for it. We're asking for it. We're asking for it to be blown on our head. Bo. Hey, it's our choice, man. Cause and effect. I truly don't care. This administrative law is much like Roman law, Roman Catholic or Catholicism law. Once again, this whole Catholic shit again in the Pope and the priests and all this stuff, which is also called civil law. Conceptually, Roman or civil law, which is practiced in most of Europe, is diametrically, diametrically opposite to the common law. Under Roman Vatican Catholicism, or law or civil law you are guilty until proven innocent and have only those rights your master the government chooses to grant you and privilege you with as if they're your god and they gave you rights when you were coming out your mom's belly or while you were being incubated in your mom's belly like they stuck their physical hand in your mom's belly and gave you rights to come out with like you didn't give me rights you're gonna be abominated son and what your master giveth, he can take away. And that's true. It's true. If you accept to be their artificial person in their creation, then they're your master. They created you. You're their drawing. They can do what they want with you. That's why you have to rebut it and deny it. And proclaim who you are. Don't just deny it. Under the common law, as practiced in America, you are innocent until proven guilty and retain all rights not delegated to government. So we're not in America no more. We're in Europe, obviously. In America, the sovereign power resides in and comes only from the people. We, the people, are the sovereigns. All the power and authority the government has been, was, and still is being given to it. And by, and it's, pardon me. All the power and authority the government has been, was, and is still being given to it and them is part of me is being is still part of me okay so i got backwards so all the power and authority the government has been was and is still being given to it is by the pretty much by the people is given to them by the people so i'm gonna have to rephrase this area if we don't have the right to do a thing then we cannot delegate or give away such a right to any government. We cannot give to anyone or anything 
any power or author authority we do not have. I do not have the power to give you my unseen, spiritual, unalienable rights because it's God. How can I give you God? How can I show you the most high? This, you know, this, that's the only paradox to this is that you can't prove it. You can't show it. You can only use it, live by it, feel it, experience it. But how, you, the only thing you can't do is show it. I can't show you it. You must trust these words. It will guide you to the lake and you must choose to drink or not. It's up to you. It's a guidance. Follow the stones. Follow the stars. It is not in controversion to this principle that representatives of the people, legislators, or bureaucrats, or judges pretend they can make laws to implement powers that we, the people, did not and cannot give them. So it is self-evident, yet they pretend that they can do virtually anything they or even a majority of them merely agree, upon, um, agree among themselves vote to do. So they vote to do and they think it's right because many people vote on it. That's what makes it stupid too. They, because we vote for them fuckers. Without thoroughly reading what they're about to in, implement and bring. I never hear them say anything about these things. Off rip. And from the beginning you can tell they're lying. They're not telling us these things. They're not exposing this stuff. Why? This is all you need. This is all you need. Once you know this you can unravel your life from there on. They publish interpretations of laws and promulgate rules based on those interpretations. Or they render decisions that are clearly and, and antithetical to the concepts set forth in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as the Founding Fathers um, understood and expounded them. And they're not the Founding Fathers because the Moorish Hebrew Israelites were already here already. Well, necessarily the Moors and stuff. I'm, I can't really say if they're Hebrew Israelite as well, but they may be. Um, but... Most of the people who did come from Africa, Mexico, were Hebrew Israelites. Most of the people already in America were Moors. So they're not really the founding fathers. You see what I'm saying? They, they are the, the invading fathers, the conquering fathers, the one that came and took this land from the dark-skinned uh, Moors and the dark-skinned Indians that lived here, the Native Americans that coexisted here before them. So this whole Declaration of Independence, Constitution, founding fathers, they came in with their own strange set of laws and they broke those two so and thereby they violate their sworn oath to defend and uphold the constitution they know that few if any who discover such usurpation will have the perseverance let alone the financial means and time regarded to to find a qualified willing attorney to utilize the court system to um expose their usurpation and bring them to account and thus rectify their malfunction so almost towards the end. They also promote and rely on a general misconception that any statute passed by a legislator is valid. <laughs> What's a statute? It is impossible for both the Constitution and a law violating it to be valid. Say it again. It is impossible for both the Constitution and a law violating it to be valid. One must prevail. This is... Um, Susquehan, part, pardon me. This is succinctly stated as follows: The general rule is that an, un an unconstitutional statute, though having the form and name of law, is in reality no law, but is wholly void and ineffective for any purpose, since unconstitutionality dates from the time of it of it of its en enactment. And not merely from the date of the decision, so branding it. An unconstitutional law and legal contemplation, like a unilateral contract, is an inoperative as if it had never been passed. Since an unconstitutional law is null and void, nullified, nuke pro tunk, the general, the general principles follow that it imposes no duties, it confers no rights, it creates no office, which means all these judges' offices are vacant, it bestows no power or authority on anyone, it affords no protection and justifies no act performed under it. 
No one is bound to obey an unconstitutional law, and no courts are bound to enforce it. The general rule is that an unconstitutional act of the legislator protects no one. The act of the man or woman creating laws out of thin air, you can't breathe, it's illegal to have teeth, it's illegal to be cute, it's illegal to live happy, you know, it's null and void. It is said that all persons are presumed to know the law, meaning that ignorance of the law excuses no one. If any person acts under an unconstitutional statute, he does so at his or her peril and, and must take the consequences. So every time you're using a Federal Reserve note, you're breaking the law. Because that's not American currency, that's England currency. Where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them. Miranda v. Arizona, 384 U.S., 436 at 491. In order for a law to be proper, it must be just, justifying, fair, equal. It must protect equally the rights of all without violating the rights of any. Leave everything untouched, unscarred. There is nothing mysterious about proper law. It is based on reasonableness and common sense and is, and is harmonious with the laws of the Most High. The bonding theory states that most elected officials and government administrators, perhaps even lawyers, are legally required to be bonded, which means under contract. That is, they must purchase a performance bond, a kind of insurance policy, which guarantees that the official will perform the, dirt, the duties required by his office. In the event the government official fails to, fails to perform his or her duties, any party injured or torted by this breach of contract can recover or redress the cost of his damages from the bonding company. So you would go to the official's bonding company, the one he made the bond with that hired him to have them, them pay, pay off their injury because the bonding company is their insurance company. This is who's supposed to be insuring them. Just as long as they stay true to that contract and that bond. Now if they break that bond and that contract, not only can they get fired and they'll have to be liable for the payments and all that stuff, their whole insurance is canceled, their office is vacant, they surrender everything. They pretty much give up everything when they um, commit an act of treason and perjury. And fraud as well as identity theft. Or oh, yeah, as well as um, um, double trading or double being a double agent working for England and working for America. You can't do that. It's like working for the enemy and working for us. I can't trust you. You got to go. Either they tell you to go or I tell you to go. You can't be with both of us. Just point blank. Can't serve more than one master in many ways. Despite the legal requirements that government officials be bonded, many perhaps most are not. Therefore, the bonding requirement strategy is based on first determining if a given official is legally required to be bonded. If Then if he is bonded and evidence can be shown to the bonding company that he is failing to meet the performance requirements of his bond, the bonding company may revoke the bond or raise his premium, which should help encourage the wayward official to obey the law. Further, if the bond is required by law in order to hold a particular office, once that bond is lost or breached, it's possible that the office must also be surrendered, right? A government official's bond, we need to start getting these people to fuck off our office. A government official's bond is dependent upon his legal immunity, and that immunity is to some extent based on having a legal oath, a fictitious oath of office on file, or man-made oath of office on file, usually with the Secretary of State, the Secretary, the custodian of state. If his oath of office if his or her oath of office is insufficient to meet the constitutional or statutory requirements, he may lose his, immunity, his or her immunity and his or her bond. If he, or, if he or she loses his or her bond, he or she becomes personally liable, lien-able, which means now they're able for lien. 
You can place a lien on them and their property for any illegal or unlawful act he commits in office. What is the definition of lien? A claim, encumbrance, or charge on a pro property for payment of some debt. Pardon me. Obligation or duty. Qualified right of property which a creditor has in or over a specific property of his debtor as security for the debt or collateral, for the debt or charge, or for performance of some act. Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 922, emphasis added. A lien is a public declaration of commercial debt or commercial liability and or a commercial obligation. Or you can just say obligation in general. A lien. Debt usually refers to money or property. Obligation usually refers to the fulfillment of specific performance. So what am I compelled to perform? What am I obligated to? You know what I'm saying? What makes me compelled to perform? It gotta be a contract, some type of bond or some shit. If not, man, no relationship between me and you exists whatsoever. You're committing an act of war and a breach of the universal principles and laws of life. Examples include the fulfillment of oath of public office or the provision of the tax, finance, due process, as in the provision or the visions that proceed of a jury trial instead of a summary process. Examples of liens include mortgages and automobile loans. In both instances, the possessor has the right to use the property once it's given to them through contract and promise and agreement and bond. However, he may not sell or otherwise alienate the property without first satisfying the lien. Any attempt to evade the lien is known as pound breach, which is a felony in most jurisdictions. Types of liens, common law liens are non-commercial lease pendants liens. Liens that must be upheld by judicial action, which means you got to go through court, um, before claims to assets can be executed or collected. Common law liens are, um, are usually used more in a defensive way to shield and protect assets rather than an offensive way to lay claim to assets. See further discussion under comparisons. Equity liens arise from an equity court or administrative court because equity has to do with money or equality and stuff like that so you can set up put a financial lien on them or equity lien or something that has to do with money common law lien will be not um, something based on common law you know saying it has to do on natural law and stuff so now you're putting a lien on what is already yours you know statutory liens are established by the statutory laws of the state so if you're under a statutory contract, then they can place a statutory lien on you or it's null and void. Mortgage liens are created by contract between borrowers, borrowers and lenders, creditors and um, debtors, loaners and borrowers. When the asset of the borrower, borrower pledged as collateral to the lender. So the borrower plans, um, pledges to give what they have as collateral to the lender. That means that the borrower was the owner of the property before they pledged it. Or all of that is nullified. That means the borrower didn't even have the house to pledge to the, the lender. And the lender don't have it because it, has, it hasn't been properly conveyed to them or delegated to them. Mechanics liens are typically um, used by repair service providers as a claim on as a claim on an item repaired to ensure payment for repair services rendered. The name originated from when an auto mechanic repairs a car and the owner fails to pay for the repair. Then the mechanic can file a lien on the car. You can do the same thing with a house. When you clean up a house and you know send my the people affidavits stating how much they owe you with an invoice, if they don't reply, they enter default, which means a tacit unilateral contract. Uh, if they don't know how to defend that or anything, then you can use that contract to actually take their house legitimately. And from there, they cannot get the house back later on once they find out that 
you know, they passively agreed to you taking it and didn't have to. It's too late. It's too late because now they can make other paperwork to secure that house and all that stuff. And yeah, you, <laughs> too late. Commercial liens, also known as contract liens, are true bills in com commerce publicly declared or a commercial security agreement. A true bill in commerce or invoice always contains and is characterized by a one-to-one -one correspondence between an item or service purchased and a debt owned, owed, especially when you're suing someone. This commercial relationship is what is known as just compensation. Fifth Amendment, U United States Constitution, just compensation. A normal true bill in commerce is private, whereas a commercial lien is publicly declared using means such as media advertising, uniform commercial codes and stuff like that, and public documents in the county recorder's office. Oh, yep, yeah, right there. And or filing at the county recorder. When it is uncontested by a categorical point-by-point -point rebuttal of the affidavits, it is considered an account receivable security. Um, Title 15 United States Code. So now you can actually re get this money out of escrow. You can actually get this money and get the property and things like that. You know, it becomes an account receivable, security receivable, especially if they don't um, contest it or deny it and it goes uncontested and unrebutted um, for whatever time stipulated in the affidavit. So if I, if I send an affidavit, if you don't respond three days to my claim and, and prove that's a lie, then it stands as truth. And I can use it to take all your shit, you know, put a lien on your house, garnish your wage and all that stuff. If you don't rebut it and you sign the um, the certified receipt with return um, signature mail that you get from the U, um, United States Postal, so um, Postal, Postal Office of Service when you're sending your mail, it's called certified mail with return receipt or registered um, mail card with return receipt. Once you sign that and you don't re rebut it, I have proof that you enter contract with me now. Through that, through that, um, that uh, return receipt card in the certified mail. So now you can't tell me you didn't receive it. You can't tell me you didn't see it. Now you're definitely in in um, admissible, um, an undeniable default, which means now you're agreeing to my terms. So when you agree to my terms, everything in that that um, affidavit or that instrument become a re account receivable. Now I can either sell you. And sell your stuff to the um, collection um, services, which is the IRS or any people who collect debt. And they can buy the debt from me. And they can buy the paperwork from me and everything that you owe me. And pay me for it and continue going after you. Now I just sold you to a debt company. This is what schools do, bill collectors do, and everything when you don't pay them or reply to their paperwork. You become sold legitimately. There's no way out of these things sometimes. Unless you rebut things and deny it and... Proclaim and state who you are. In general, commercial liens, for example, mechanics and workmen's liens, take sen um, sen sen seniority over common law liens, which in turn take precedence over mortgage liens. Take lien tax liens are classified as commercial liens, which is why they are so troublesome. Common law liens are well known in the sovereign community for asset protection. They're considered non-commercial because they do not contain a declaration of one-to-one -one correspondence between an item or service purchased and the debt owned. Owned. Thus, they do not represent true bills in commerce, a true invoice. Because of that defect, a non-commercial lien must be ad adjudicated by a court of common law before the asset can be claimed by the other party. And, is and it is therefore known as a lease pendants lien. So when you do a commercial lien, you don't need to go through the court to enforce it. But if you do a common law lien and, and you know just a little basic stuff, you're going to have to go to court to fight it and come with evidence. So commercial liens are non-judicial and pre-judicial, pre which means it's not based on court and it's before court, but you can take it to court if it's not being fulfilled and you can't find anyone to enforce it. So make sure you have your evidence, make sure you have your proof, get everything together, and boom. You will learn that in our community, school, and tribe. 
The commercial value of a lease pendants lien rests upon the outcome of the pending litigation court, the court event, the pending court event. Hence, it is a security. It is a collateral, but it's not an account receivable, which means you can't get it yet or take it or grab it until it is adjudicated as such. Until the judge or the jury says that, yeah, you're right, this does belong to you and it should be receivable. You see, so common law liens are different than commercial liens. So common law liens are normally used as defensive shields and that by placing it on one's own asset to be protected, no other party can legally get access to the asset without first challenging the lien in court. Point for point. That's why it is called a lease pendants lien. The lien might be filed at a county recorder and never be challenged in court. And this is where the mortgage people send their, their trust deeds and mortgage paperwork once they do them. They send them to the county recorder and send the promise off to the treasury and they get paid for it. You know, like they get paid for this stuff, you know. And it's never, if it's not challenged, then once it's in the recorder, it's your house, it's your property, it's your thing. So because parties who have no just and legal right to the property will usually avoid the risk of failing to prove the claim in court. So if they can't prove their claim, they're not going to reply to your affidavit. They're not going to rebut it. They ain't going to show up in court like, dang, he got me. Fuck, fuck. <laughs> you know, if I rebut this and stuff, I know I'm going to be lying because he got evidence. He got proof. Dang. Let me just pay them off. You know, you, you got to get them stuck in that. They're humans. You got to get them stuck in that feeling and vibe. Scare the shit out of them. Don't fuck with me. Don't touch my stuff. I'm not playing with you. I'm a powerful being. I'm a powerful man. Backed up by the creator. Yahawashai. All right. So it is considered asset protection since it is dif difficult or impossible for anyone to get at the equity in an asset. To get at your money in your asset or your savings. If a lease pendants lien of sufficient size has senior position. A commercial lien by contrast is offensive in nature in that it declares a legal right to someone else's asset as a debt owned or owed as a one-to-one -one correspondence with an actual asset that was given. It is not a lease pendants um, con um, common law lien because the exact value is already specifically determined through your three unrebutted um, notices of dishonor, your three unrebutted notices of default, or your three um, notices of non-response. So whatever you put in those three, three warnings is what you're going after. That becomes an asset after three unrebutted affidavits. So it is consistent with the laws of commerce. So it is specifically determined, determined consistent with the laws of commerce, commercial activity. It is a true bill that can be enforced and collected upon pre-judicially and non-judicially. What is the definition of levy? A seizure, the obtaining of money by legal process through seizure and sale of property, where they take your stuff to sell it to make money, which is almost a form of liquidation or foreclosure, a levy. The raising of the money for which an execution has been issued. This is how they raise their money. The process whereby a sheriff, a sheriff, or other state official, office servant, empowered by writ or other judicial court directive, actually seizes or otherwise brings under their control a judgmental debtor's property which is ta or a loaner's property or a borrower's property or a beggar's property which is taken to secure or satisfy the judgment the promise black's law dictionary sixth edition page 907 a levy is the outright seizure of a property and satisfaction of a debt or obligation exempt me from levy a lien on the other hand is an encumbrance on property a claim to a property or interest in a property this is mine or this is what they owe me uh, it's a claim it has to be rebutted in order for the claim to not be a claim because if if you claim it and you can prove that it's true then you know who can stop you from 
having the claim over it. Who can stop you from having it? So I have a lien on my body. This is my body. Who can rebut that? Point for point. Hey, this ain't your body. This is why this ain't your body. Like, how can you prove that? So a lien is a supreme law of the land because it can't be rebutted. It can't be um, terminated without being argued. It cannot be terminated without the matter being expressed to be resolved. You see? So although the two often accompany one another in judicial or commercial actions, they are not the same thing. All right, we're near the end. Hope you guys learned a lot. The last two videos that we'll, we'll do will be sovereignty and nationality, which is two important um, sections that people need to know what sovereignty truly is and what nationality is and, and save their ass. Get yourself out of the system and stuff, man. Just know who you are, claim who you are, and so much things. The Constitution encompasses, encompasses admiralty jurisdiction, and admiralty jurisdiction encompasses the Uniform Commercial Code. And the UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, encompasses contracts, including the coloring agreement, color of law agreement, fictitious agreement. And the coloring agreement encompasses the Constitution, once again. So the Constitution is the color of law. It is a fictitious law based on contract. A. The lien instrument must obviously, patently, and evidently be a lien by being clearly and explicitly titled lien, claim of lien, or declaration of lien, and mandatorily by its exhaustive commercial content. So put as much exhaustive, undeniable truth in that lien and as its content. Full disclosure, as follows in B, C, and D. Here we go to B, C, and D. The lien instrument must contain a notarized hand-signed affidavit for which the issuer or the claimant or the affiant is commercially liable, containing a plain statement of fact disclosing how the obligation of the lien was created. You know, from cleaning the house, from a car accident, from what? You can. This is the real true way to sue people, guys. Like, ugh. Some people just don't need to know this stuff. And they won't. Attesting, and the lien must be attesting, which means um, consenting, and, and, and wait, attesting, which is another form of testimony. It should be testifying that the commercial condition is true, correct, certain, and not misleading. So you got to put these things in your affidavits too, that this affidavit is done true, correct, certain, and not misleading. And I am competent for stating the facts herein, and I am um, stating the facts under the risk and penalties of perjury and all that stuff. Because now they will have to, under your unlimited commercial liability, so now the other person who's receiving this will have to enter the same square too, and most of them don't because they'll get in trouble. It's under risk. You know we made a contract. So all right. The lien instrument, C, the lien instrument must contain a ledger or bookkeeping statement connecting purchases, services rendered, and or injuries sustained with a claim of obligation such that each purchase, service, and or injury is presented in a one-to-one -one correspondence, a direct injury, a direct, a direct damage, one-to-one -one correspondence with this partial claim of obligation so you have to have an invoice or some type of paperwork stating what is to to be given how much is owed you know what has led to that type of number you know like hey i charge ten thousand i ch charge fifty dollars per hour and i've worked for 10 hours you know what i'm saying this is why i'm coming up with fifty thousand dollars you see so now you make a true a true bill which is an invoice stating um, he owe you fifty thousand dollars. You add up in the invoice box. I work five hours, blah blah blah, at fifty dollars per hour rate, and this is why they owe me this. And if they don't rebut it and stuff, that's still that's them proving that it's true. You see, so now it can be enforced, even if it wasn't true. You have to reply to your paperwork, guys, or you're in default. Default is the god of 
is of the system. You want them to enter default. You want them to not to dishonor you. You want them to not respond. You want them to not say things and it and make them think that you're crazy and that you don't know what you're doing. As long as you know what you're doing and they're thinking that, you can use it against them as admissible proof in court. Let them think what they think. They're gonna dig themselves into a hole. So the partial obligations are then totaled to obtain the total obligation. So you, you tally up everything. This is called a true bill encumbrance, a bill of exchange that an exchange has been um, made um, definitely. And it's also an invoice and a bill statement stating a bill and why. D. Actually, that's what the people do to us. The bills, the bill people, they send you a bill that you don't need to freaking enter each month it's a new contract each month but because you think you have to pay the bill each month and you're convinced you have to pay that bill of exchange each month without getting another exchange or anything in exchange you when you don't respond to it you enter default which means now you have to enter or they can take the, the the service they gave to you before because you didn't tell them hey we have no new contract for you to be billing me again you know what i'm saying once we make a trade it's a trade once I pay $10 for the headphones and stuff, or whatever it is, that's my headphone, that's your $10. You can't, I can't come after you for another headphone the next month, and you can't come after me for, a, a, the, uh, for, the, for more money the next month either. But if I don't rebut it and be like, hey, I already paid you money, I don't owe you, and if you don't rebut the fact that you gave me the headphone already, you know what I'm saying, and, and don't be like, hey, if you don't say, hey, I gave you the headphones already, I paid it off, then I can come get the headphones again. It becomes a new contract there and then. That's why they enforce it and can enforce it because it's a new contract each month that has not been rebutted, which may becomes a true statement. That's why you're paying bills. You have to rebut all these contracts. You have to talk. Sovereigns talk. All right, let's continue. The lien instrument must contain a statement either specific or general of the property being seized from the lien debtor to satisfy or to um, guarantee satisfaction of the obligation of the lien. E. A notice of lien to be valid must contain a clear statement as to where the lien is filed. Because the county record, the UCC, whatever you, wherever you're doing it, where it can be found and how a copy can be obtained. Because you have to make this a public announcement, a public notice. That's why commercial liens are public notices. So the people can know. And if no one fight it, no one rebut it, then everyone's accepting it. You know, the whole world pretty much. That's how you make a solid copyright and trademark on your straw man. The notation of security. Title 15 US, USC, United States Code Tracer. And you have to make sure on your um, commercial security agreements or your commercial liens, you put Title 15 USC. And this is um, denoting to this, um, the Security Exchange Commission because the Security Exchange Commission is the people who pretty much change all securities. They exchange securities, which is your bond, birth certificate, everything, the stock market, everything. They have all your information, everything. So when you need to get all the property from the straw man or the debtor that owes you something, you go through them and they will go through the paperwork and find their stuff and then just go from there. You see? Now you're dealing with the people who has their information. You don't need to ask them for their information. You just have to go to their, the IRS and people like that that have their information and enforce it. Or sell the paperwork to them and they can deal with it and they pay you the money. Or less or more or whatever. You are the master. So this is all man-made law. This, this is ridiculous. That's why I saw this stuff fictional. It's not real. So the Title 15 USC... Tracer is a flag in commerce telling the United States Security Exchange and Commission that a speculation account is being established to enforce a lien. So this is a flag. This is literally a commercial lien flag. You're stamping it on there that, hey, this is potentially going to be sold in stock market. This is potentially going to turn into a, a account receivable. Someone's going to get paid for this. So if you want to go ahead and sell this to an investor that want to pay me right now for it and get paid more later on, because you, you know here is the flag pretty much denoting that jurisdiction. You see that power. This is why I'm getting the authority. So now when they get that, that um, 
security agreement or that commercial lien, they can sell it to investors to make money. You see what I'm saying? They can sell it in the stock market. And these investors, the way they make money is by hoping that the debtor that's supposed to pay it never find out that they don't have to pay it. Because the debtor pays this, this illegal, involuntary servitude bill each month for no reason. And that bill that they pay each month ends up becoming a trillion dollars after a couple of years of paying it each month. And nothing's worth that much. You know, paying $2,000 for a freaking car each month is bullshit. How long? 10 years paying off a car $2,000? Now you multiply $10,000 um, $10, times 12 times 10. That's too much money. That's almost a gazillion dollars for a car. So these investors that invest in these people make that amount of money. It's like a tax lien. They make that money. So now once the debtor realize they don't have to pay it, everything falls apart. All the, the investors pretty much lose money. But the crazy thing is that the system is built to support the investors so they still win. AIG and all these insurance, these big top insurance companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, all these people and stuff, you know, they bail out these bankers. They bail out these creditors and they bail out these investors. Therefore, they all get paid and that poor little debtor who didn't know they didn't, they didn't have to pay all that money for so long never gets reimbursed. So, like, these people, man, creating this game, man, they know what they're doing, man. They know what they're doing. It's deep. So, the United States Security and Exchange Commission can then monitor the process, which means now you can track your bond by using, you can track the commercial lien by using registered mail numbers as the, uh, the, as the bond or promissory notes number. So now when they put the promissory note number on their system, you can just use just your registered mail, or certif well, registered mail um, number to track it down in the stock market and see where it's going, whose hands it is in. You can do this with your mortgage as well and track your mor mortgage down because your mortgage and your house have been sold to someone else. Plus on top of that, your liability has already been paid off and fulfilled. It's been paid. So now you can use the number to your mortgage um, um, reference number, whatever it may be, and type it into this, um, the Fidelity.com website, investment website, or the Security Exchange Commission website. Your number will pop up and they'll give you all the information about it. How much money it yields, where it's going, whose hands it's in, and you can use that paperwork to go to court and, and prove that the mortgage has been paid off. So, like, there's a lot to this, you know. Get with our tribe. Get with our school and community. I will be digging deep into it. And I will not be sharing too much information like this that much anymore. I have to go share this with people who deserve to hear this and keep this in secrecy. It's not going to help if this information gets into the wrong hands, you know? So, all right. So, as long as the process is being truthful... Open and above board, full disclosure, the United States Security and Exchange Co um, Committee or whatever has no jurisdiction over it for even the United States Security Exchange Commission has no jurisdiction over the truth of testimony, dis depositions, affidavits and affidavits of obligation, commercial liens and unrebutted affidavits stands as a truth in commerce. So there are many remedies in man's fictional laws, but there can be a lot of hell to pay dealing with man-made laws, obviously. Man thinks he is God of man and can tell man what to do and when. Man thinks he can outsmart the Most High by lying to him or herself and hiding from the truth. Man believes that he will die without ever being punished for his or her wicked deeds. Therefore, man's laws are either in compliance with natural common law or completely against it. Men's laws are based completely on contract and consent and cannot work without it. It's the only way to enforce liens, beat cases, get compensated for damages, and so on. Let us continue to dive deeper into what man's laws are. Proceed. So now, once you are a member, you get more information about um, private law, contract law, statute law, national law, merchant law, corporate law. I'm not going to do videos about these things. I'm putting out too much already. But the world needs to know this. You know, I am doing this out of good faith. 
I'm not doing this for you to agree with me or disagree with me. I'm not building this school for you to agree with me or disagree with me. I am here to give the option to know the truth. That is all I'm here to do. Just an option. Now it's all up to you. You do what you want in life. So, I mean, that's pretty much it on this video, guys. Um, the next video we have will be on sovereignty and nationality. So make sure you stay in tune. I hope you get what a man-made law is and why it's artificial. It's art. You know, it's art I, in official, official art. It's not natural L. And um, just, you know, ask me any questions if you do. Uh, if you have anything that you'd like to give for donate, please contact me and let me know. Um, I am um, open to receiving gifts. It does help out the movement, does help out everything else, and it does motivate me to give out more free information. And lately, people has not been donating to me, and they have not been helping out. And I'm not forcing anyone, but I'm starting to realize that maybe some people just don't give a fuck about what I'm saying or doing. Maybe I'm wasting my time. Maybe I might die in vain giving out all this information. The ones who know it are watching me and stuff and ready to kill me because I'm exposing it. And they realize y'all ain't with me. So if, if I notice that I'm going to be left alone with this, I'm going to just keep this to myself, benefit myself. And when things go really good for me, you know, I'll, I'll come back and share a little tad bits. You know what I'm saying? But don't put yourself in a situation where the people who's giving don't want to give no more because they have nothing else to give. I have a family to take care of and so do you. Do the, make the right choice with your money. Either invest in our school, in our community and learn what you need to learn or donate something so I can feel the, the, the want and need and yearning to give more free information away. You see, we live in a system where there's money. I cannot forget about that. I cannot be sidetracked from that. Only the devil will try, try to tell me, oh, I don't need to work or I don't need money, man. I, I comprehend what, what you guys feel and think. That way of living and thinking is not universal. It's not common because it had... It, have, it destroyed many lives. It has destroyed many people thinking money's evil. Oh, we shouldn't make money. And, but then you got all these other people making big money and stuff off of selling junk. Might as well make money sell good things. You might as well make money selling things that will benefit people. This is my job. And I'm going to continue doing it. Much love, every, everyone. And the vibrations of Adonai, An Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya, Yahawashai. May you all live in peace and prosperity. Shalom.